Welcome to another episode of Tiger Graph Unchained. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dan McCreary, who is the head of AI at Tiger Graph. I'm really, really excited to be talking to you, Dan. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Well, as you you well know, I have just joined Tiger Graph a couple of weeks ago, and my new role is head of AI. I'm just really excited to begin this new role. Uh, I should just give you a quick background about myself. Uh, I've had a, a very interesting career, career through a lot of different industries. I started out as an integrated circuit designer for Bell Laboratories. I worked in the supercomputer industry for a while. I worked for Steve Jobs in California for Next Computer as a solution engineer with them. I am a published author with a book I wrote called Making Sense of NoSQL, organized conferences on architectural trade-offs of different databases for a long time. But in the last couple of years, I have really been focusing on my passion, which is knowledge representation of how do we take the world around us, represent it in a way in a computer that can model that world. And specifically, I've done a lot of work in very large 25 billion vertex knowledge graphs for healthcare and learned so much about the scalability of Tiger Graph. And that's really why I'm here, because I know that Tiger Graph is really a rock solid scale out system. And, and just to let you know, I ran a benchmarking center, right? Uh, we had a budget of almost $10 million at United Health Group for benchmarking all these different things. We bought custom racks of hardware and would assemble it all. And there was no system that was even close to Tiger Graph in our benchmarking, especially when we took into account we were simulating clinical workloads. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, worked with the Dell Center in Austin. You might know how they're very, very good at tuning all this hardware and yeah. disk and I.O. and network cards. And when Tiger Graph is on the right hardware, it just screams and there's nothing close. So that's really why I'm here, because I, I really feel as if we're going to build the electronic brain for companies it has to be on a system that will scale. I don't want to have to go to a company that says, well, you did a really good job in this, but you're going to have to completely change your architecture to go to the next yeah. level. That's not going to fly. It's got to scale from day one. Definitely makes sense. I do recall, Dan, in one of our recent internal events, you mentioned this new term, the intelligence graph, which got me really excited as part of your AI charter. Can you tell me a little bit more what did you mean by it? And what's your vision around the intelligence graph? Yeah, uh, great question. I think a lot of this had to do with my realization that many companies are taking what I'd call a siloed approach towards dealing with their customers, with their products, with their uh, core businesses. And what we find is that even though they can solve some problems in these silos, if they don't bring all this information together, they can't really get to what we call emergence. Emergence is where you have suddenly new insights that differentiate you from your competition. And so what I tried to do is I tried to build some storytelling to help executives understand what I meant by these systems. And I, I came up with a story, we call it the jellyfish and the flatworm story. Mm -hmm. And uh, it goes like this. It says, uh, uh, imagine a jellyfish floating in the open ocean, right? Mm -hmm. The jellyfish lives in a simple environment its uh, nervous system is relatively simple, about 8,000 neurons, right? Mm -hmm. And all it has to do is kind of position itself to hope that fish come into its tentacles. It didn't need this complex nervous system. But on the bottom of the ocean, about 500 million years ago, this thing called a flatworm started to evolve. And the flatworm had to move around mm -hmm. its environment, mm -hmm. right? It, it had to figure out how to move towards its prey and avoid its predators. And when it did that, it realized that if they, if it couldn't build a little model of that world in its central nervous system, it couldn't really navigate its environment. And so all of the animals on planet Earth that evolved central nervous systems did this because they realized by centralizing this information, they can make better predictions of what's the consequences if I'm moving towards danger and I turn around, I'll move away from that danger. And now I ask the same question for companies. Are you more like a jellyfish hmm. or are you more like a flower? Now, let me tell you, there's a barber down the street, Mark's Barber, wonderful barber. They don't really need to have a complex information yeah. system, right? They're hands-on. They're like the jellyfish company. Uh, they're simple. But you know, 
a lot of companies today aren't like that simple systems. They have complexity. They have employees. They manage knowledge. They have many products. Those products have many competitors. They have different pricing models. There's substitution costs. There's switching costs. You know, business is complicated today. And we can't make a prediction. What if we change the price of this product up 10%? What's going to be that impact on our profitability? unless we can model the world around us. And that's really the story of the centralized brain. And, in, and a lot of people say, well, this is really important just for customer service or just for product management. But I think it really has to do much, much deeper. It's what is the philosophy of the company? Are they trying to be a world-class paper? And, and remember, we have companies like Google that have been using knowledge graphs since 2012, mm -hmm. uh, Amazon's product graph, 100 billion vertices, e even Pinterest now yeah. has an interest graph, 100 billion things. Those are world-class companies. Mm -hmm. I think today, if you want to move from being a, a small niche payer into a global competitor, you can't do it in 100 silos. It's just not going to work. Yeah. Well, you need this information together. You need to be able to query it. You need to, need to integrate natural language to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is going to power the future. So that's my my kind of short-term vision of what's why I think that intelligence is really going to happen in companies today. Got it. That, that's really amazing. I really love the story around the jellyfish and the platform. It actually resonates really well with me in terms of the need for additional understanding additional knowledge and additional capacity. I do want to ask, though, why Graph and why do you think Tiger Graph is well positioned to deliver on this vision of the intelligence graph? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, I'm a voice of experience here. I have been using the system for a long time. It's not a theory. I have ha practical hands-on experience running it in our benchmarking and evaluation center. Uh, yeah. and, and also working with partners, right? I could have never done this without partnerships from Dell's benchmarking system. You know, this is hard. Hardware is a complicated thing. You can't just slap a bunch of things together and throw it in the cloud and have it magically work. If you're really going to be world-class, you have to rack it, connect it, optimize it and tune it con constantly to do that. But why Tiger Graph in general? I think it's really because of the way that Tiger Graph started. It was started by engineers that had already experience with Teradata and other very large distributed mm -hmm. systems. And they said, we are going to build a system from the ground up that makes the assumption that this graph has to live on multiple servers, potentially hundreds of servers, and we need to optimize everything for that assumption. Now, that is a different assumption. And you know, back in 2010, 10, when people were just starting to use Java and they had virtual machines, they could have it run in a little virtual machine. That was fine. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Those systems didn't scale beyond that little virtual machine. And they never will scale beyond virtual machines. Uh, they have to be written from the ground up. And I think what it tells me is that Tiger Graph started with that thing and that's part of the Tiger Graph company culture, mm -hmm. right? If somebody says, hey, I mean, I have this new feature. Uh, it's only going to run on a single node. Is that okay? What would you say? No, right. That's, that's something that's part of everything that we do at Tiger Graph is to make the assumption that our customers need to scale. And so everything in our products, everything we design, everything we create talks about high availability, scalability, fault tolerance, transaction integrity. All of those things are part of that corporate culture. I see that at Tiger Graph. I've always known it because of the knowing the founders. And uh, I really want to be part of that a solution for the future. That's awesome. I think you kind of hinted at it as part of our discussion earlier, but I'm really curious if you could ground your vision in reality by maybe sharing some use cases you think are very applicable to the concept of using this intelligence graph. What, what are some of the use cases that come to mind? Well, well, the first one I always start out with, because I think it's the one that's most obvious, is all the information about our customers, mm -hmm. right? and putting them all together in one spot. This is often called customer 360 mm -hmm. or a member journey is another name for it. But what what's what we find is that when you first start working with customers, 
you might have an application like Salesforce, right? And that's how you're going to do your processing. Once they come in, they buy a products and then they're going to be going to your website. Uh, maybe they're doing searches on your search engines. Maybe they have questions, they call into your call center. Maybe they have products that have inventory, product management. And what you start to see is that because there are so many vertical applications, customers, all the knowledge about customers quickly gets spread into these silos. And in order for you to really serve your customers, you want all the touch points of your customers to be in one spot. When And by the way, touch points is a very big word, right? Every time you touch a customer, every time you send out an email, every time you have an inbound call or an outbound call, every time they fill out a satisfaction survey, every time they come to your website and they put in a search in the keywords, all of that information is a touch point for our customers. And right now, if I go to many people and say, you know, I've been working with you for several years, show me all the information that I've that you've had, uh, every webinar I've been to, every seminar, and what you find is that scattered all over the place. Companies that really are serving their customers best. And, and remember, this is not a trivial thing. When you recommend a product, mm -hmm. uh, Amazon today has one of the best recommendation engines in the world. It's just mm -hmm. amazing. It's addictive. My wife tells me I buy way too many things from Amazon because I see those. If you buy uh, buy this, you'll probably like this. Yeah, all those books, you know, you've recommended some great books. I not only bought those books, but I bought other books related to those books, right? And uh, Amazon is rumored to make about $40 billion a year mm -hmm. just for recommendations. Yeah. So that's real money, right? This is something that if you're running a website and you can't predict what products are going to fit your customer's needs, you're not going to be competitive and your 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 competition is going to come up. So that's customer 360. I can do the similar thing with product 360, right? Everything about the products, right? We, you have an iPhone, that iPhone has so many components. Those components have subcomponents, all these other things. Everything around us in consumer electronics has vast arrays of parts and sub-assemblies, these uh, bill of materials, BOM files, uh, think of a car and all those parts. Those things are incredibly complex and disruption of just one little component can disrupt your manufacturing sector. Yeah. Well, that's a dependency graph, just like go. we have a customer 360. And we have to be able to manage those correctly and make a prediction if one supplier doesn't come in, how do I quickly make sure my production doesn't get shut down and I can get parts out the door quickly? Yeah. And then the last thing is to realize is that we, we're talking a lot about dependencies. There's a phrase in the graph community, graphs are everywhere. I have another one, dependencies graphs are everywhere, right? Mm. I I see the world through this lens of dependencies of that when we want to build something, it depends on 10 things. If we have a software service, it depends on a bunch of other software services that depends on hardware, that depends on networks. We have these incredible dependencies around us, but we don't manage them. We don't have the insights. We can't make predictions on those dependencies. Uh, even in education, right? I do a lot of stuff in training. I know that when I am volunteering in a school and I'm teaching robotics, that those concepts depend on other concepts. And if I don't help our students figure out what that baseline is and how to get to the things, those dependencies are blockers for them achieving their educational goals. Absolutely. Any, anybody who's doing education, anybody who's doing training uh, needs to be able to embrace documents and their dependencies and their concepts and put them all together in a central knowledge graph. I, th I think that's going to transform colleges, universities, even high school is going to be dramatically changed by our ability to manage dependency graphs that are in the world around us. Yeah, that actually makes sense. And actually it reminded me also one of the prior companies that I worked at, I was leading product and innovation for American Family Insurance, referencing back what you said about the call center. The team that I put together for that specific effort was able to not only trim down the time per call to answer customer questions because of the innovation we did around an intelligence component uh, for that call, but also was able to add additional value through in-call 
intelligent recommendations for upsell, cross-sell of insurance products, for example, right. and customers right. would like it to be truly personalized mm -hmm. to their profile. It doesn't make sense for you to offer the same insurance product when they already have a another one. Or they, like, for example, if it's a single family or, or a single a single person, you would not recommend a family insurance. It doesn't make any sense. So right. it has to be that personalization is really needed. Yep. Now, having said this, I would like to touch a little bit, go a little bit deeper because I will tell you there is always that challenge that somebody would put forward. I could do what you just said, whether it's customer 360, member 360, product 360, using relational stores. Why do I need a graph? If you could just elaborate a little bit more, what makes a graph better suited for this kind of use case? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the bottom line is it's performance at scale. Mm -hmm. Performance at scale. Now, my, my brain is a little odd. It works a little different. I have this weird thing that I can kind of see data moving through systems from my background. Incredible curiosity. I just love reading source code for uh, databases. And the fundamental picture that I have when I think of a relational database is a system that has tables of information that stand outside. And when you want to find relationships, you have to bring those tables in and start to compare rows of numbers for every query you do. That's mm -hmm. called a join. Joins are incredibly time consuming. And the more joins you do and the deeper the joins, the slower they get exponentially, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's why many modern OLAP, online analytical systems, try to minimize joins by using either what's called a star schema, a mm -hmm. single fact table with a few tables around it, or a snowflake schema, which is a fact table with a few two-dimensional things. Those things are designed, they model the world in a primitive way because they can't do more than two levels joins. The real world has relationships. Mm -hmm. And so relationships must be a first-class citizen. When I think of a graph database, I think of this program counter hopping through memory. Mm -hmm. Every relationship is a pointer. Out. Now, I've built computers from the chip level. I know what program counters are. I know they're lightning fast. And I know as long as the things are in memory, that they can traverse relationships about 2 million hops per second per core. 2 million hops per second. Now, remember, a lot of computers we have today have 256 cores, so they can do almost uh, 2 billion edge traversals per second. Mm -hmm. That's so much more than an old relational database. Almost five orders of magnitude on a single core, on a single server, I should say. And if I do 100 servers, that means that I have a huge, huge orders and orders of magnitude performance difference. You can't compare that anymore, all right? That's the difference between a company that can make instant decisions on recommendations at the time a person's at their website versus a company whose cursor is gonna be spinning and they're gonna simplifying the world by putting things into fact tables. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a completely different world. It's going from punch cards to the brain, right? Yeah. And that's really the metaphor that I'm trying to say is we got to leave the world of flat representations because they were convenient on a punch card and move towards a knowledge representation of the world around us that's focused just on the same structures as our brain, neurons and relationships. And fast traversal is core to that process. Yeah, I, I think in your description, you really articulated well why a graph is better suited. I will add one thing which was implied in what you said around the speed and accuracy, but there's also another flavor uh, is, is the freshness. When you have to create fact tables or when you have to create a star schema or a snowflake and so forth, there's always that element, how fresh is the data? Whereas with a graph, the beauty of it is that because of the way it's able to look at these connections in real time, a lot of that anal analytical processing happens in real time. It's all based yes. on the latest data, 
nothing is kind of stale, no errors in terms of replicating, copying or whatever, intermediate steps, intermediate tables, all of that goes away. And I've heard that actually firsthand from many of our customers. So it's really good to yeah. hear it from you as well. Yeah. Just to one one quick story. When I was at my last company, we supported about 50,000 people in call centers around the world. Mm-hmm. People frequently order a product and then immediately say, well, I ordered the wrong one and pick up the phone and call the call center. If that call center didn't have about a 30 second late latency between the order entry system and their customer support, they couldn't answer the questions, right? So latency is absolutely a very big thing. The service level between an event happening in an operational source system and the knowledge graph in many cases has to be very, very short. Any change, insert, update, delete, 30 seconds, it has to be in the knowledge graph. You can't do that in traditional OLAP uh, systems. Those indexes just take too long to update. Absolutely makes sense. So last question for you, which is what's next for you? in terms of your vision? Well, a couple things. So we want to, first of all, acknowledge the fact that we're living in a very new time where the rise of large language models has created a whole set of new opportunities for us to increase the speed that we ingest data and increase the speed that we get data out of our knowledge graphs. So I don't want to underestimate the fact that we are in new territory here. Uh, and hopefully that's what we'll be working on together. How do we deal with these large language models and their tendency to hallucinate when we try to build chatbots? Uh, how do we increase the speed of mapping data from the world into our knowledge graph using AI and metadata mapping? Uh, how do we take an English language query and map it not to a bunch of codes, but to a series of concepts and maintain those concepts so you can talk to the knowledge graph in terms of the concepts that you know and you're familiar with. I think the big challenge is to build architectures that accelerate our adoption of centralized knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs are are just a tool, right? They're not going to replace it. They're not transaction safe. They don't really store knowledge in a central way that you can insert and update and delete facts, right? They're, the, they're kind of like a hologram. That knowledge is spread across all of these weights. Uh, it's a it's a useful tool, but it's not a representation of the world. And so what we need to do is build hybrid composite systems where these large language models are Lego blocks that help accelerate our adoption of those things. So for me, the next thing is to understand the potential of those tools, bring them together in a holistic, harmonistic ways that doesn't jeopardize our high availability and our reliability and allow people to really get more out of their knowledge graph. And 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 then to realize that we're just seeing the beginning, right? There's an important thing that we have to rem- remember is that intelligence is about building an outside model of the world and using that model to predict the consequences of our behaviors in the in the in today, right? What if I change the price of this? What will those things happen? And large language models don't model the world, they model language, and they're useful tools. But if we're really going to look at the brain, we have to realize that even today, knowledge graphs could be enhanced to do those, many of the things. The human brain uses something called reference frames, and reference frames allows our brain to transform data as it moves throughout their neocortex, to have deeper insights, uh, and to build patterns and build concepts around that. We have to integrate those concepts to to really get our knowledge graphs to to transform data in ways to make it the most useful for our users pulling data out. Uh, And so it's going to be building hybrid systems that combine language models, that combine knowledge graphs, and combine the future looking reference frames so that we can emulate intelligence and allow people to extract the most value from these centralized knowledge graphs. Awesome. Very exciting. Well, Dan, I just wanted to say it was truly a pleasure having you with us today and certainly look forward to kind of what comes next from your team. So thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Awesome. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.